In case you missed it, here's Dave and Cheryl's favorite moments of the week. As you settle into your Monday and maybe another work week, a new report from Microsoft says employees spend more time on emails, meetings, and chats than doing their actual jobs. Yeah, they found that those things are actually the number one distraction for workers and that this type of communication takes up more than half of their time during the workday. Wow, the report says the constant influx of data, emails, meetings, and notifications has really outpaced our ability to just be able to process all the information that is coming in and that there are three times as many meetings and calls per week than there was just three years ago. And why do you think that is? I'm betting Zoom has made it now so much easier to gather people together. They could be halfway across the province, halfway around the world. You're pulling everyone in on a Zoom call. Oh, you can be, You they need to be in on that meeting. And then you get in that meeting, you're like, why am I in this meeting? And also meetings that could have been an email. <laughs> Nearly two thirds of workers feel they have trouble maintaining the time and energy needed to do their actual job. So managers, bosses, business owners, take this to heart. This is a massive study done by Microsoft, pulling in data from all over the place, lessen the amount of meetings and emails you're sending to your employees. Maybe you'll see productivity go up. Yum, science. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Check it out, I blinded us with science. Studies show visiting museums, viewing great works of art in person may promote various health benefits and, you know, well-being and mood. But what about viewing it online? So they say the prospect of seeing, say, maybe Van Gogh's Starry Night or something from Da Vinci on a computer screen instead of in person doesn't really sound that satisfying. But they've done a ton of research on this and an international study, too, where you can still get a mood boost from online art breaks. So afterwards, each person completed a survey asking about their state of mind and how much pleasure they felt while looking at the paintings and how meaningful they felt the experience had been. And sure enough, the results show that people reap significant improvements in mood and anxiety after just a few minutes of viewing art online. So stressed out at work, maybe take a little break, a little art online break. Say, excuse me while I change the wallpaper on my computer right now. To Starry, to, starry Night? To Starry <laughs> Night. That would be amazing. Although I did have a chance to see a bunch of Van Gogh works in person when they were mm. at the Detroit Institute of Art back in January. Now, the world's first artificial intelligence speed cameras just launched in the UK, and people are already calling it, quote, a step too far. So the controversial creepy cam has highly advanced technology, making it able to watch what drivers are doing while inside their own vehicles. Mm. Right now, motorists can be caught on camera for a number of infractions, including not wearing a seatbelt, using their cell phone while behind the wheel, or if there are too many people inside the vehicle. Apparently, it uses this super high-spec 4D radar and super resolution cameras to peer through your windows, as well as performing the you know traditional traffic cam duties, you know, running through red lights, speeding, that kind of thing. Uh, the camera goes a step further, though. It links to police and government databases to check your driver's license and your insurance status, too. So they're even making sure that you're registered for everything and that you're a licensed driver. Critics are saying it's a uh, big brother. And really, you mean way AI is going now? It's a scary world we're I guess I'm going to have to go and tint the windows in my car so I can't I see me make so make a well. difference. A slice of watermelon, summertime favorite, and a new study has found it's really good for you, too. So researchers found that those who ate the fruit regularly had a higher quality diet, including higher levels of fiber, magnesium, potassium, vitamin C. And in a trial, 18 men and women drank watermelon juice for two weeks. Participants saw positive health benefits and for their heart and a change in their heart rate. So they say it's just a rich source of antioxidants, vitamin C, and so much more that can really help you with heart disease prevention. Reach for some watermelon. Okay, now I gotta go change my my wallpaper too. And pick up some watermelon. <laughs> and I gotta pick up some watermelon. Good to know. And avoid this intersection in the UK. And I guess while I'm at the store, maybe I'll also pick up some Brussels sprouts because you may have noticed that Brussels sprouts in the last couple of years are really having a moment. They seem to be popping up on every menu. People are posting about them. 
Well, someone on TikTok asked that question about why Brussels sprouts seem to be everywhere these days, and the response he got went viral. So any kid who grew up in the 80s and 90s can tell you that Brussels sprouts were incredibly bitter when we were kids. But in the 1990s, a Dutch scientist, he identified the chemical in Brussels sprouts that makes them bitter. So in the 90s, the chemical that was producing that bitter flavor was bred out, crossbred with higher producing varieties, meaning we got more Brussels sprouts that weren't bitter. So by the time the 2010s rolled around, there were lots of Brussels sprouts and they didn't taste bitter anymore. And suddenly they're incredibly palatable and thus really good on restaurant menus. Genetic mod- Modification isn't a dirty word. It's how we make tasty vegetables today. Huh. Yeah. So you mean I have to try Brussels sprouts now because I uh, never really like Brussels sprouts. I'm I'm still not a huge fan even of these like new Brussels sprouts. But that's just personal preference. Like I can eat a couple, but I mean I'm not going to sit there and down an entire bowl of them. In what one if sitting. you cook them with a lot of butter and a ton of bacon? That seems to be the consensus <laughs> of how to make them taste better. Makes everything taste better. <laughs> Imagine if you showed up, you know, you just want to go through the drive-thru and grab some lunch, and you didn't know this was going on. Longest line ever. Uh, McDonald's in Wichita, Kansas, just set a world record. After their drive-thru processed more than 350 orders in one hour. The employees actually pitched the idea to the franchise owner last year, and they've been planning it now for six months. About six months ago, they decided they were going to try to set a record in the drive-thru, and so we went and looked it up, and... Best we could find was 300, and so that's what we're trying to do today. As you could tell, there was a lot of cars. We had traffic backed up on the highway all of, for over a mile. So 356 in an hour, that's moving a lot of cars. That's better than one every 10 seconds. Amazing deal. So customers were in on it, so that's how they were able to go so fast. So people got there early to line up, and cars stretched for over a mile. Now, they intentionally made their orders simple so that every car that went through had to order something, pay, and then get their food. Um, they say the drive through at that location is always pretty fast, and they pride themselves on that. But if Guinness can confirm the record, they can officially call themselves the fastest drive through in the world. Well, I ran to McDonald's this morning, grabbed us some coffee, and I'm pretty sure I was behind a car that had gone through the drive through for the first time ever in their life. They're just going so slow through the parking lot. I'm like, okay. And then Very unsure. Took like forever at the thing. And then they got to the window. And then they were asking for extra napkins and condiments and all kinds of stuff. And I was just like, I just want my coffee. They cl- well, they clearly weren't a part of this uh, world record breaking attempt then down in Kansas. Now, sometimes you go on a plane, you might see an emotional support dog and cats, that kind of thing. You don't expect a scorpion. A woman on an Air India flight was stung recently by a scorpion as the plane headed to Mumbai. Apparently, once they landed, the passenger um, was looked at by a doctor at the airport. Uh, was then taken to hospital where they were treated and then released. Uh, they actually had to fumigate the entire plane, too, after they landed, just to be safe. Yeah. The airline says it was an extremely rare and unfortunate incident, which makes me wonder if someone had smuggled this on in their carry-on. And maybe they were trying to take it somewhere else. So now there's going to be a new movie with Samuel L. Jackson, uh, Scorpions on on a plane. (laughs) Hey, looking for a job to be outside, maybe play dress up? There's a zoo in England that's looking for people to wear bird costumes and scare away seagulls. That's exactly what it sounds like. You'd have to dress up as a bird of prey. And guard the zoo's main dining area because it sounds like um, seagulls are a bit of a nuisance and try to steal people's food while they're just trying to eat lunch. So they say the ideal candidate is friendly, energetic, and comfortable in costume. And have to be like, caw, caw. And I guess maybe they should look at hiring this guy. Uh, Belgium has a new gull screeching champion. That's actually pretty good. Yeah. So this is annual contest that they run where people impersonate seagulls. And this 21-year-old won this year. He also dressed up as a seagull, you know, for added effect. So maybe yeah. he'd be the perfect fit for this. <laughs> they need to, you know, hook him up with that zoo in England. <laughs> Often in life, there seems to be two kinds of people. Those that, you know, your gas tank starts to get down, you fill it up. The others that just keep going until it's like my daughter, 11 kilometers left to go in her car. <laughs> the gas light is on and going, why aren't you stopping? Stop now. And then those <laughs> that, you know, will clean up the mess that's there and others that apparently just keep walking. There's a new spring cleaning poll out and it found that 49% of adults admit that they will ignore a mess and leave it for someone else um, to clean up after them. A and lot. It's something they do a lot of times too. Often or always. It doesn't work in my house. 
No one else is going to clean it up. Well, maybe the dog. If it's food, my dog will he clean that. That gets cleaned up pretty quick. Yeah, they are good for that. So here's a few other spring cleaning stats. The top five spots we dread cleaning the most are floors, rugs. Yeah, rugs can be a pain because it's you vacuum something and it's like, how is it still stuck there? And then you got to like actually pull it out mm-hmm. uh, inside the refrigerator. Ooh, that reminds me, I need to do that. Windows, yes, our Ugh. windows need to get done because yep. we have dog nose prints. <laughs> Always. Yep. And the dishwasher. Cleaning the dishwasher, I mean, you have the, if you, depending upon how old your dishwasher is, you can run it on those cycles now. No, but like you should take the filter out yeah, and, you and clean that. that out, that kind of thing. And it can be pretty, pretty gross. Microwaves and closets just missed the top five. Yes, because the closet becomes a storage mm-hmm. area. Hey, most of us admit we actually do cut corners when we clean. 53% say they always or often do, and only 9% say they never cut corners. Baseboards? Do you, do you wipe down the baseboards? Yeah, every once in a while. It depends. Mm, same. The rooms we spend the most time cleaning are kitchen, bathrooms, bedrooms. I spend the most time there. Yeah. The time that we're most likely to do a deep clean isn't spring. It's when we know guests are coming to visit. <laughs> you got family or friends coming to stay over for a few days. And maybe you're, oh, no, we got to really clean. Yeah. Can someone just call and say they're coming over in 15 minutes? Like, I feel like I would probably get <laughs> my house looking spotless. And finally, when we do a deep clean, it doesn't last for long. The average person says their home actually starts to feel dirty again in only about 12 days. So not quite two weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's that's impressive. 12 days, you must not have little kids. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's always when I'm working out that I'm like, oh, this is dirty. That's when I notice all the things. I think it's maybe because it's lying, I'm lying on the floor. <laughs> and now I'm looking, I'm like under the couch and under oh, chairs. No. And you're like, oh, that's, that's no. so dusty. Like, <laughs> under things. <laughs> You just walk on by. That's because I'm on the floor, though, <laughs> like doing setups or something. Yeah, we both have dogs, so we don't have to do this. You ever do this in your life? Something falls on the floor and you just maybe you kick it under the fridge of the stove. <laughs> When you were younger, maybe? Just like, mm-hmm. I was going to say, I live alone, so it's going to be a bit of an issue because then I'm the one who's just going to have to clean up that fuzzy, no. mold-covered piece we, of a cl- item. We established, don't look underneath things. That's your first mistake. Tranquility base here. It's one small step for man. One crazy overpriced wedding for mankind. And you thought going to a destination wedding in Jamaica was expensive. Check this out. Uh, Weddings in space could soon be a thing. There's a high-altitude balloon company called Space Perspectives that is doing wedding packages, and they are hoping to start sending people up by the end of next year. So you can launch from land or from a boat at sea. The whole thing lasts about six hours, uh, but most of it is just getting up there and then coming back down. For the first two hours, you slowly rise up to about a... 10, uh, sorry, 100,000 feet. So you're on the edge of space, but you don't actually feel weightless. After that, you get two hours to hang up and get married up there. Then you slowly return to Earth and splash down in the ocean. Now, it does have to be a small wedding, though, because the capsule only seats eight people plus the pilot. And I would assume one of those people would have to be your officiant. Although, can you become an officiant in space? Like, what what are the rules around that? I mean, a captain can marry you uh, on a boat in the ocean. So, so does the pilot marry you when you're on the edge of space? I feel like he probably has a dual role. It's $125,000 per guest. So if you book all eight seats, it's a $1 million wedding. Now, what do you get for this? Like, is there food provided? Do they DJ? Are there lights? You get to go up near space. Like, do they provide you with at least flowers or something? There's a refundable deposit of $1,000 per guest to reserve a spot. Uh, But if you want to be the first couple married in space, you're probably out of luck. They've already had a ton of requests for this. This reminds me of Mike and I had a story, I think, when you were off about a company that is doing fine dining experiences up in space. So similar to this... But I mean, I, I don't want to shell out that much money if I don't even get to feel weightless. That seems like a rip. Your ears pop now on a plane going 40,000 feet in the air. Could you imagine 100,000 feet? But I'm assuming this is a much slower ascent and descent. So sure. that, I would assume that would have an impact on it then. How cold is it? Are you going to have to get married in a parka? I'm, I'm assuming it's like insulated or something. Like, like it would a spacecraft. Can you go outside on the edge of it? Like, is there a window you can... I have a lot of questions about this. I'm pretty sure you can't open the door, Dave. $125,000. I should be able to go outside.
Sometimes we talk about very serious things, things going on in the world, things that have happened to us personally. And sometimes we have a little fun and talk about silly things. Like, um, is your thumb a finger? Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. Is your thumb a finger? Someone recently pulled 8,000 people and not everyone agrees. 22% said thumbs are not a finger. They're just thumbs. So almost one in four. And thumbs, obviously, are a little different. They have only two bones instead of three. So do the non-finger people then have a point? So Merriam-Webster's dictionary, uh, the definition of a finger doesn't even uh, put the question to rest. They say a finger is, quote, any of the five terminating members of the hand, but especially one other than the thumb. So even they're basically saying the thumb stands alone. So where do you stand on this? I don't know. So, um, I, I mean, I'm not a medical expert, but is, is your thumb considered a phalange? Isn't that the medical term? It is. It's one of the terms I learned when my wife was going through nursing school. It always stuck in my head. That and medulla umblongata. We should have, brain. We should have asked Kat then mm-hmm. if um, is, a, is a thumb a phalange still? But yeah, no. as I said, it is different because it's only two bones instead of three. I, I, mean, I would be with the 22%. I'd say, no, you've got four fingers and a thumb. Because you don't really def- necessarily differentiate between your other fingers, do you? I mean, I know you got your pinky finger and your ring finger and your finger when you're angry in traffic. And like, then you've got your pointing finger. I'm thinking when I, the t- all the times I've hurt my, myself playing sports, you know, basketball, volleyball over the years. When I have hurt a finger, I say I hurt my finger. But if I hurt my thumb, I specifically say I hurt my thumb. You don't say thumb finger. I don't say I hurt my finger. I say I hurt my thumb. You like you specify it. All right. There's a couple of other random things this poll asked. Are your ears part of your face? No, they're just a part of your head. Twenty-seven percent say no, that they're a part of your head, but not your face. Well, because I would say your face ends like at your ear, at the edge of the ear. Yeah. So I guess we're in the minority with that, because I would agree with that. I too. would say this. You know, in the movie Face Off with Nicolas Cage mm-hmm. and John Travolta, they didn't change ears, did they? They just changed everything in front of the happened? ears. So I don't since know. I've watched that movie. I can't remember. And is your shoulder part of your arm? Is your shoulder part of your arm? Yes. I would say it's connected. That's tough because it's, I don't know, everything goes together eventually, right? It's all kind of connected. 21% That's- say no, they're separate things your shoulder and your arm. But getting back to the original question. But I don't know. I want to say this, though, too. If you hurt your shoulder, you say, I hurt my shoulder. You don't say, I hurt my arm. Same thing. So when you're asking this, is your thumb a finger? What do you think? Uh, text us if you want to have some fun with this. 519-351-6300. Let us know uh, your stance on this very important burning question and issue. Is your thumb a finger? You've been listening to Dave and Cheryl's favorite moments of the week. 